Welcome to the Stony Brook University Preview Week session. We're happy you've joined us for today's presentation, Experiential Education in the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. I'm one of your hosts, Amanda Mills, Assistant Director of Admissions. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be available for viewing on the admissions YouTube page. I'll post a link in a little while. If you haven't already done so, we do recommend attending one of the undergraduate admissions information sessions, which are offered virtually most Tuesdays and Fridays through December 20th. These sessions go into more detail about the general admission requirements and feature information about majors, campus life, student support services, and much more. Also joining me from admissions is Ryan Donnelly, who will be monitoring the Q&A during the presentation with me. Please use the Q&A to ask questions for our presenters and we'll save time at the end to answer them. You can find the Q&A at the bottom of the Zoom webinar screen. Today, we're joined by faculty and staff from the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences who will be discussing opportunities for experiential learning within SOMAS. Nancy Black, the SOMAS undergraduate advisor, will also be assisting us with the Q&A today. Dr. Kurt Bresch, the Director of Semester by the Sea and Marine Science Club Advisor, Dr. Brian Coley, Director of Atmospheric Sciences and Meteorology Club Advisor, Dr. Tara Ryder, Director of the Environmental Studies major who leads the annual trip to Ireland and is the Society for Women in Marine Science Advisor, and Dr. David Taylor, Director of the Environmental Humanities Track in the Sustainability Studies major who leads, to the, who leads our annual trip to Cuba. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Bresch. Good evening, everybody. We're pleased to have you here tonight learning about experiential education with SOMAS. We're gonna be talking about a lot of opportunities that you can take advantage of while at SOMAS as an, as an undergraduate. Now, of course, your foundation of learning while an undergraduate at the university and with SOMAS will be within your courses. What we want to talk about tonight is building upon those courses and seeking out educational, or sorry, excuse me, experiential education experiences. So you can see on the left of the screen, we have a brief outline of our talk tonight. We'll be discussing research opportunities, project-based courses, field-based courses, a scuba program that we have, study abroad opportunities led by by SOMAS faculty, internship opportunities, employment opportunities as an undergraduate, undergraduate teaching assistant opportunities if you'd like to accrue some experience teaching, the broader semester by the sea program, and student clubs. So these are the examples of experiential education that you can take advantage of while at SOMAS. But your question might be, why should you seek out these experiences? Well, over on the right, we have a list of reasons for why we encourage undergraduates to really go beyond just their signing up for their courses. So one of the things that you can do is actually apply the concepts that you learn in the classroom. You can go out into the field or out into uh, a potential work workplace environment and take those concepts you've learned in lecture and apply them out in the world. You can also build your resume with these experiences. As you've noticed, many of these are internship experiences, jobs, they're experiences that give you some training in specific skills or techniques. You can also meet lots of people outside of the university even and network in your field. This can lead to opportunities for scholarships, for internships, and potentially jobs, either as an undergraduate or after graduation. You also get exposed to lots of new ideas. So when you're learning about a concept from your professor in class, you might be exposed to other people who are inv involved in that same idea. And you can see that their perspectives, what they're thinking with that concept. When you do a lot of these experiential education opportunities, you'll meet faculty, you'll meet employers, you'll meet advisors that can assist you and finding your next job by providing strong letters of recommendation that can speak about your character, your academic performance, and so on. Experiential education opportunities also allow you to confirm your decisions. Are you in the field that you want to be in? Um, perhaps not. Perhaps if you have one of these experiences, you might close some doors behind you. And that's part of the process of advancing as an undergraduate and figuring out what you want to do with your job in your field. 
And then finally, employers, they really want undergraduates with experiences beyond just taking classes and building your transcript. They want to know that you've gotten involved, you've learned some skills outside of the classroom, and you've accrued these experiences. So that's what we're going to focus on today, how you can accrue those experiences while a SOMA student at the university. Next. All right, so I'm going to start off talking about opportunities for getting involved in marine research. Now, we're going to be talking about marine research, atmospheric research, and sustainability research. And these are our, our three divisions within SOMAS. And what we have here on the screen are just some of the many, many uh, topics that our professors study and that undergraduates have gotten involved in. So you can kind of read through that list, um, and perhaps something will jump out at you. It's important to recognize, though, that as an undergraduate, you can approach nearly any professor and ask them if you can get involved in their research as an undergraduate. And so by doing this, again, you can try on the field. You can see if these topics are really what you're interested in. You can also build those letters of recommendation and all of the other benefits that I talked about on the previous slide. When you're doing research, not only do you get that experience in the field, but you can also earn credits that help you advance towards graduation. So we have faculty in the Marine Division that are working regionally, nationally, and globally. And we encourage you to get plugged into a research program as soon as you arrive um, at Stony Brook University, or at least in the, in the first couple of years. Um, okay, next. Great. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about atmospheric research. Uh, many of our atmospheric students in, at SOMAS get involved in research uh, by their even first or second year. Uh, there's a number of opportunities. Uh, uh, this is just a short list on the on the upper left. Uh, but we have opportunities for those students who want to get involved in the field and uh, and take observations of storms, either in the wintertime or the summertime. Uh, for example, the upper two panels, uh, we actually have a NASA impacts project, and we're going to have it again this winter, uh, in which we actually have a, a, tr a truck with uh, a variety of instrumentation, including a radar. Uh, you can see that little flat screen on the back. So we take that out in the field. We measure winter storms with that. The students launch weather balloons and collect data. Uh, uh, they also would have a variety of hands-on instrumentation. And also at SOMAS, we have labs in which you uh, and students can get involved to study things like air chemistry or, or things that are happening within the clouds, but in a laboratory uh, setting. So, so there's a, a number of ways uh, that, uh, you know, that everyone can get involved. Next slide, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. I wanted to talk a little bit today about just some of the projects that we work on here in sustainability. Um, these range from everything from environmental designing and planning to uh, Dr. Pochran's uh, worm lab research, which you'll hear a little bit more about later, uh, to some other work uh, like the projects you see in front of you. Uh, the, these are four different projects some of my students have worked on. Uh, one of them was about uh, sort of looking at the questions about the actual health of the Hudson River and then uh, balancing that against uh, public perceptions of its health in a story map using uh, ArcGIS technology with a survey. We've also done every uh, things from actually documentary film about uh, Lee Koppelman, the um, uh, Suffolk County planner for over 50 years, to some other work by students working with the Climate Action Project uh, between high schools all the way uh, to the governor's office. Uh, we also do other forms of outreach and communication uh, work. And Ashley, who you see here, worked th with the uh, Sart, uh, Shark Research Team out of the uh, South Fork Museum, uh, working with them about how to sort of have people rethink their uh, perceptions and maybe uh, misperceptions about sharks. Uh, next slide, please. Hi everyone. So not only can you do research outside of the classroom, many of our classes are um, based around projects because one of the best ways to kind of really understand an idea or a new concept is to look at it through the lens of real world problems and challenges. And so many of our courses are um, project-based courses. Um, so we've got the ecotoxicology lab, um, which you see in kind of the middle, and that's where we have students who get the opportunity to 
uh, design their own experiments as well as um, implement them. And they study uh, toxins such as Roundup um, and the impact that they have on soil, on worms. And it's a, a incredible experience where students have even been able to get their research published from this. Um, we have another course in sustainability, which is our uh, integrative collaborative systems course. And students have done a variety of projects um, that have ranged from uh, designing a project for a pollinators garden in which they went after a grant to help fund it and then um, they designed it and then they built it here at Stony Brook University so when you come you can come take a a, a breath of fresh air and check out our pollinators gardens but this is one of the the strengths especially as you get into some of the upper level classes is that you're really not simply studying what's in a book you're you're putting it into a real life um, project. Next. Yeah, another uh, example of uh, hands-on courses uh, within atmospheric sciences is our journalism 372 and 373. Uh, we have a school of uh, uh, communication and journalism here at Stony Brook in which they have a state-of-the-art TV studio. And so uh, uh, our uh, we've taken advantage of that uh, with uh, with uh, collaborating with them with doing weather broadcasting as a part of those two courses. And so we have a number of students each semester get involved in this in which they do a weekly broadcast. Uh, they go out in the field. Uh, they do their weather forecast. They learn how to edit those forecasts and get it ready uh, for uh, for publication each week uh, as part of a, a, a program. And so uh, this is a great experience, not only for the students, but they they get to make uh, basically a video or tape, which really helps them if they're interested in getting employment in uh, in news broadcasting or weather broadcasting. Next slide, please. At SOMAS, we like to offer a lot of field-based courses for our students uh, with the intent of getting the students out into, as it says, the, the field. And the field for us here on Long Island can be the forest, the Pine Barren Forest. It can be the coastline, the rocky coastline out at Montauk. It can be the sandy beaches. It can be aboard our research vessels. We have several teaching vessels that we take students out in, into the field on. Um, so here's a list of several of the field-based courses that we offer uh, within SOMAS. And the idea here is, again, to expose the students to the concepts they've learned in the classroom and get them out there and introduce them to the habitats and the organisms and the cultural sites that we've discussed in the classroom. Um, while out there, especially at the cultural sites, students often have an opportunity to interact with docents and guides and rangers, and they can expand their own network and kind of talk about uh, jobs or summer positions or internships with the folks that they meet out on some of the, the field trips. The field trips also offer an opportunity to learn um, scientific sampling gear in the various habitats that we explore. And that looks great on a resume for jobs or grad school afterwards, getting the training and the, the tools and the techniques that um, we use as in our various academic fields. So again, here are several of the courses that we offer within SOMAS that are really field intensive. Um, and depending on what semester you're in and what courses you take, you can spend often uh, you know, nine, 12 hours out in the field, depending on the classes that you're taking. But we'll circle back to that in a little bit. Next, please. Okay, recently, we've created a scuba program within SOMA. So this kind of straddles that kind of field-based experience. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about this because if you're interested in scuba, either for recreation throughout your life and exploring the, 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 the underwater world, or as a tool, as a, a skill to have in graduate school or with a profession, you can get certified while a student here at SOMA. So starting on the left, we've got MAR 102. This is a certification course that Hampton Dive Center offers um, down here near Southampton. We offer it every fall, every spring, and then the Marine Science Club offers it in the summer. So plenty of opportunities to get that base certification. And we also offer a course called Scientific Diving, in which students are trained to use, again, the tools and the techniques of scuba divers for graduate school and for jobs. And then the next two courses, are abroad courses. So I won't talk about these too much because Tara's gonna discuss this very soon, uh, but they are part of this, this scuba program. Tropical Marine Ecology takes students to Jamaica, typically every winter session. 
And this is an opportunity to learn about coral reefs, the organisms that are there, coral reef ecology, um, and spend several weeks down in Jamaica on scuba or on snorkel. And then the fourth course, co coral conservation. This takes place in the Red Sea. It was first offered last spring, but it will be offered, sorry, last June, but it will be offered again this year. And this is an opportunity to go to the Red Sea and learn about coral conservation techniques and programs there. Now, it's primarily a snorkel course, but there are opportunities for scuba divers uh, to go if they have a lot of experience. Uh, students also need a 3.0 GPA, so there are several kind of hoops you need to jump through first to do scuba on that trip. Uh, but this is our kind of scuba program that we offer at SOMAS. Next, please. And that's a great introduction to the fact that um, not only at Stony Brook do we have a, a large array of study abroad programs, but um, we have quite a few programs that are led by SOMAS faculty. Um, so as you just heard, we have the program to the Red Sea. Um, we have a, a phenomenal winter program um, where you can study in Jamaica, as Dr. Brush just talked about. But we do also have several other programs. So um, we have a winter program. Um, to Cuba, where you can look at um, issues of sustainability as that country has had to, you know, kind of deal with um, issues of kind of sustainability entwined with economics, entwined with politics, um, entwined with ideas of tourism. Um, I also lead the program to Ireland. So we have a winter program and a summer program. And the summer program especially um, really focuses on contemporary um, environmental issues, and we look at it through the lens of what's happening in Ireland as well as in England. Um, and so we spend a lot of time outside hiking, and um, we're not only are we discussing these issues, we're actually investigating them. So students have, you know, gone exploring at the recycling centers in Ireland to see how that compares to what we're doing, say, in the U.S. So it starts to give a, a much larger um, kind of global perspective doing these programs. Um, we also have the program to Tanzania, which I've also been involved in, and there they're really looking at um, really the issues of environment and health. Um, and again, kind of recognizing how society interacts with the environment and what the consequences are. And the wonderful thing about study abroad is not only does it introduce us to um, so many new places and cultures, but we students can earn credits towards their degrees while doing it. And uh, my students come back consistently um, after applying to grad school, after applying to jobs, saying that this is what, uh, you know, employers and uh, graduate programs were interested in hearing about. They wanted to hear how students were able to kind of, you know, problem solve at a global level. Um, so again, we're, we've got a, a number of programs that students can um, participate in. They can even do more than one program and it can help them continue on their academic journey. Uh, next slide. So um, one of the things that uh, I think all of us talk to our students about is the importance of doing, uh, oh, there we go, <laughs> is uh, doing internships. Uh, this is something I know in all three divisions in uh, SOMAS that we really talk about because, uh, as I remind students often, that the environmental field is a relatively small field. It's not just thinking about Long Island or even New York. But it's rather that as you do work with some of these uh, groups uh, as an intern, that it really carries sort of consequences and reverberations nationally. You get to know the people who might end up being uh, those you work with and work for. So we really stress the idea that students should certainly be doing internships. These are just some of the places that our students have interned. We actually, though, um, run an internship event for SOMAS in uh, March, in which we have usually between 15 to 20 uh, groups interested in finding interns for the summer. And we spend about an hour to an hour and a half in a uh, Zoom session sort of talking about the possibilities for students and thinking about uh, what are the kinds of things students would want out of these internships and what would the groups want the students to participate in. Um, I would encourage you uh, in thinking about, uh, you know, a university or school in your education, no matter where you go or what you're thinking, please really consider the value of an internship. 
it is that place uh, where, again, as we've been talking about during this, uh, this uh, discussion, that uh, what you learn in the classrooms is significant. It's important. We have to have those skills. But it's also in uh, the environmental field really important to practice those skills outside the classroom. And I think an internship is an excellent chance for you to get to do that. Next slide, please. Okay, a couple more opportunities that we wanted to introduce here that are provided through SOMAS are undergraduate teaching assistantship opportunities. And of course, you can do this uh, throughout the university, um, but there are several courses within SOMAS where as an undergraduate, if you want to gain some teaching experience, typically you've taken a course, you've done really well in it, the professor knows you, and you can actually earn credit by assisting other undergraduates when they sign up for that course. So again, if you have, a, if you have any um, if you'd like to get involved in education, either as a career or, or as part of your career, this is a great opportunity to get comfortable with those skills, those teaching skills. And again, looks great on your, your resume. Over on the right, just wanted to mention that, again, at the university, there are lots of ways that you can find employment. Um, within SOMAS, there are a few things you can do. Down at the Southampton Marine Station, which I'll get into on the next slide, um, we often have students that are employed as deckhands, and they are out on the water several times a week, even beyond their classes. They're deploying equipment. They're learning real skills and getting very comfortable on, on vessels. Um, I also have here that research labs, um, some of them, some of the faculty research labs do pay their students to do research. So not only can you often earn credit, but sometimes you can even get paid getting involved in research labs. Next slide, please. Okay, this program, the Semester by the Sea, um, I promised I'd be really, really tight with this. I'm the director of this program and I, I love this program. Um, so this is the program that the university and SOMAS offers at the Southampton campus, which is about an hour east of the main campus. So there's no application needed for students. Um, this is part of the university and SOMAS's programming. Um, but this is a program that's designed to provide undergraduates in their junior or senior year. So not as a freshman or sophomore, but these are all upper level courses. So you need to wait till you're a junior or senior to come down to Southampton and really immerse yourself in a lot of the marine science and maritime studies, uh, the courses that we offer down here and the various experiences that we've been talking about. So there are plenty of experiences to do those or, or opportunities to do those field courses, to get involved in research in the labs down here, to get involved in internships with our uh, organizations surrounding the Southampton campus, to be employed as a student down here as well. Um, now, again, this is located at the Southampton campus. You can see our marine station in the picture in the, in the top left with a few of our vessels there. This is a location where we have access to Shinnecock Bay, the Atlantic Ocean, uh, Peconic Bay, Peconic River. It's a fantastic location to get out on the water and learn about the ecosystems and the issues there. It's also typically a very small cohort of students that are doing this semester by the sea. In the fall, we often have maybe 20 to 30 or so, and in the spring, uh, a few less th than that. Um, but it's, it's again, it's, it's all about getting these immersive experiences um, with this small cohort that's sharing social experiences as well. Now, it's, it's best for MAR and MVB, so the marine science, the marine vertebrate biology majors generally, but we do have lots of other majors, including atmospheric science and some of the sustainability majors that participate sometimes. So anyway, just wanted to mention the Semester by the Sea mm -hmm. as a very experiential educational program that's offered within SOMAS. Next, please. Yes, uh, <clears throat> another way to interact with your fellow students and socialize is get, to get involved with a, a number of student clubs here at SOMAS. We have a, a large number here. As you can see, we have a Marine Sciences Club, Environmental Club, uh, a Meteorology Club, for which I'm the, the advisor for, uh, uh, Sunrise Climate Justice, a Society for Women in Marine Science. So these clubs are really helpful because they, they allow students uh, to socialize and interact um, and help each other, basically. I mean, uh, these students in these clubs are helping to, to tutor each other. They, they, they uh, meet weekly or biweekly and discuss internship opportunities and experiences that the students have had in these uh, various uh, opportunities, either in internship or research. Um, 
They also uh, 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 have budgets uh, that are provided on main campus such that they can actually go to workshops and conferences so they can actually network with professionals out in the field. And, uh, and this is uh, very important, uh, obviously, for jobs and, and getting uh, uh, to know others out there uh, that, uh, that have similar interests and so forth. So I always encourage uh, the students to get involved in the clubs and, and they're very well attended uh, and, and they have a lot of fun. Next slide. Okay, I think we, we've wrapped up um, our experiential education yep. presentation. Yes, so uh, I'm sorry, I'm just, I have my camera on here, yeah. So one of the things that, um, so we have a bunch of questions, which are great. One of the things I wanna clear up is this wasn't my question. Um, the first question was, is storm chasing offered? <laughs> so we were just talking, I'm laughing because we were just talking about this before we started the webinar and I said, how how great it would be to be a storm chaser. So somebody actually asked this question. This was not me that asked this question. So um, is, is something, at least with the atmospheric sciences, is there anything that I guess um, is offered where, you know, you're, I, I know you were talking about the, the weather uh, truck and stuff and analyzing and, and, and also having uh, the balloons and stuff. Is there any, anything else that you would add to that? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a few of us faculty go out and we take that truck where I use it for winter storms. So I'm chasing winter storms, but that's not the same as tornadoes. But Michael French, a uh, faculty member here, uses that truck and has an, another experiment called Perils in the Southeast U.S. in which they do, in fact, uh, look at severe storms, uh, you know, tornadic type storms and so forth. And, and some students have gotten involved with that. We don't have a specific storm chasing course, you know, <laughs> in terms of that, but, but there are opportunities to get involved with using that sort of um, uh, radar truck and looking at either, uh, you know, springtime storms or winter storms. Great. Um, the next question is, um, uh, I would like to ask if majoring in marine science would have um, uh, have researches or learning. Um, uh, I, I'm thinking this. What the student is saying is, um, would would uh, majoring in marine science have research and learning how to protect marine life? Would that be part of some of the curriculum in terms of um, research in protecting? I guess what they mean is protecting uh, marine life. Yes, absolutely. So a lot of our courses. Um, are solution-based courses. So we have the marine vertebrate biology major, which actually focuses on cetaceans, so, so whales, dolphins. Um, we have uh, several fish courses. Uh, many of our courses, we focus on organisms, uh, seabirds as well. We have a professor doing seabirds, uh, microbes as well. Um, and we also focus on ecosystems and in, uh, in which the organisms live and interact with the other other players and the, the physical environment. Um, so much of the research that folks do um, in the marine division is focused on understanding and sometimes protecting those organisms and the systems in which they they, they are living. Um, in fact, in Shinnecock Bay, uh, there's a program called SHRP, the Shinnecock Bay Restoration Program. And it was just designated a hope spot by Mission Blue. This is an international organization. And the hope spots are those spots around the world that have shown um, uh, uh, a lot of uh, positive progress in restoring those environments for the organisms that live there, including the, the humans that live there. So Shinnecock Bay, we've done some uh, clam restoration down here. Uh, we do a lot of seagrass restoration, fish monitoring, and we've seen some dramatic improvements um, I say we, but it's, it's some other faculty that are actually doing all, the, all, all this work, um, but they've dramatically improved the Shinnecock Bay. So yes, we, we have a lot of focus on organisms and the systems in which they live. Uh, how often would you spend your time out in the field for marine science? So that'll depend on the courses you take and on the experiential education opportunities that you take advantage of. So again, everything that we've been talking about today um, is pretty much optional. So you should be focusing on how you can accrue these experiences. So again, it really depends on what you do as a student. If you're focusing just on the courses, um, 
it depends obviously what courses you take. If you're in the semester by the sea program during doing marine science, and you're here in the fall, which is our active field season, because it's pretty nice here, right through even November, uh, you can spend a lot of time out in the field. Um, some students will have three field trips a week um, in the semester by the sea program. Great. Um, does the school, uh, so, so the next two questions, um, I was looking at these questions just before we got to the, the end slide. Um, so the, these two questions kind of focus on cost. So um, if you know, or around about, we're not putting you on the spot here, we could always get this information to these students um, and find this out, but does the school cover flight costs for the SCUBA program? Or is that an additional cost that maybe the student needs to be you know, aware of maybe um, the, the the student would would need to be aware of that um, okay. and, and likely take care of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, is uh, there so th this question might be a little different de depending on upon which which program. So um, whoever wants to chime in as well, um, is there an additional cost on top of tuition for any of these programs? Um, I mean, typically flight costs, right? If so, for study abroad. Um, those are um, extra costs. However, a couple of things to be aware of, we offer a slew of scholarships um, and it is very typical for students to get at least some scholarship um, to cover part of their program. Um, so that's the first thing to keep in mind. And again, um, there are some elements where financial aid may actually assist depending on what program they're doing. And again, their particular financial aid packages. Um, so there's also that element um, kind of coming into play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I can chime in on this too, because I've known some students through the years um, going through that we have that have worked in our offices and have done study abroad. And never once had they complained about the cost factor. There was always something that they could apply for ahead of time um, that would cover many of the costs. Um, you know any extra associated costs. So uh, definitely, it was a good point because I've I've had that, those students mention those types of things too. Um, that would I was cover. Say if it helps this summer for the Tanzania program, twenty students, twenty of them had at least a partial scholarship um, yeah. for the program. So it can be pretty significant. Some of them ended up only paying for flight and not for housing or food or tuition. Mm -hmm. So again, can be really very significant. Um, it depends on what they apply for and what, you know, what options they're, they're taking. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, this is a specific, um, question. Uh, what is the meteorology club like? Um, <laughs> it's very broad. <laughs> Yeah, no, they're, they're a very tight knit group. Uh, they meet every week. Uh, sometimes I visit to see what they're up to, but uh, they're always planning, uh, uh, you know, uh, various outreach and trips. They're going to, for example, the American Meteorological Society meeting in Denver, uh, many of them. And so they, like I said, they have a budget to do that. So they're going to be able to network with other fellow, other students out there and, and employers. And so uh, and many of them are involved in the weather broadcasting that I mentioned, so they're they're helping each other. So it's really uh, helped create you know a very close knit community uh, within within atmospheric sciences. So uh, so it, it's it's been very beneficial for everyone. That's great. And you know it's a great way to meet other students too. You know and and long friendships and and that type of thing too, which is great. Um, it's, also, it's also, can I jump in for a second? So it's yeah, also, yeah. Um, you know, we see some of our best student leaders in these clubs. Mm -hmm. um, this is a great opportunity to uh, to learn and enhance your leadership skills, which again, are something that any employer is going to want to see that, that, that you have. Um, we have some very strong students leading these clubs and they're, they're just fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, does the SCUBA program pay and give you the hours to get SCUBA certified? Um, I, yeah. I get, I'm assuming no on this, but uh, if you guys want to clarify. You, you, are, you are correct. Um, so <laughs> so the, the SCUBA program, it is something that you need to pay for. Um, so several of our courses, the field courses, especially sometimes the lab courses too, uh, there's often a, a student fee involved with that. And it depends on what kind of 
materials are being used in the lab or what vessels are being used or vans are being used. Um, scuba though, there is a, it's, it's a dive shop that's giving you the certification. So whenever you get certified in scuba, no matter where you go, you're going to be paying for that certification. Um, if you do it as a class, not only do you, yes, you are paying for it, but not only do you get certified, but you can also earn credit doing that. Which definitely works. Yeah, yes. definitely. Um, is there housing for Southampton campus as part of the semester by the sea program? Yes, absolutely. So we have some dorms here at Southampton, or sorry, some, uh, the, the term is um, residential housing. <laughs> sorry, I'm trying to, trying to tweak this. Uh, residential housing um, down here at, at Southampton, and they're actually suite style. So that means that they are um, uh, large units that have uh, several bedrooms. I always forget the number, but some of them are singles, some of them are doubles. You have, you know, Perfect. shared bathrooms and shared kitchens as well. Uh, we don't have a, you know, a full-on dining hall down here at Southampton. Instead, the students, they prepare their own meals um, and they often eat together. Um, so it's a very kind of diving, different living arrangement in some sense than some of the options up at main campus in that we just have the sweet style living down here. Um, but yes, we do have some dorms down here. We also have opportunities to be an RA as an undergraduate. And that's something we really encourage um, because that does help pay for some of your costs. You do get your room covered um, as an RA, that is a resident assistant in the, in the, in the housing, yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, more of a curriculum question, um, do you start classes for your major in, uh, you know, as, as soon as freshman year? And that again, will depend on everybody's program. Um, you know, I, I know, I mean, I know, it's especially for, you know, with marine sciences and, and, and marine vertebrate biology, you're taking the general chem and bios, the calculus first, the foundation courses. Um, do you know about when typically, uh, you know, when the students start getting into more marine science or marine vertebrate, and then we can go into this, the, um, the environmental majors and then uh, environmental humanities as well. Sure, sure. I'll start off with marine science. So um, we've just uh, we're just implementing um, that uh, kind of a new curriculum in the marine science major, where the marine science majors are required to take oceanography, introduction to oceanography. So this is a 100 level course. So moving forward, um, students will actually get right into their major right from the get go if they want to take that their the fall of their freshman year. If they can fit it into their into their schedule. They can dive right in there. Um, um, the upper level courses, uh, again, typically those are reserved for, for, for juniors or seniors, because as you said, you do need the prerequisites first. Um, you need uh, SBC courses, the Sony Brook curriculum courses, you need the bio, the chem, the physics, and things like that. Hey, Brian, what about um, atmospheric science? It's pretty much similar, right? Yeah, very similar. I mean, uh, students start off typically with some of the, um, uh, you know, general uh, background courses in some math and and physics. Uh, uh, depending on the experience coming in, you can uh, sometimes take an atmospheric science course or two your freshman year, but most of them, uh, most students start the fall, the sophomore year. Okay. And how about some of the other majors, um, you know, with um, you know, if you know with the, um, you know, sustainability, um, the, more of the environmental uh, majors that we have here, um, is it any different in terms of? Um, you know, again, I think this is, it, this is very common at universities that, you know, the first year or two, you're um, taking some of the classes that allow you to do some of the more kind of broader themed classes later on. Um, but I'll, I'll also say, I, you know, I've, I've found that in sustainability, if you're taking a class, <clears throat> for example, in modeling, um, you're actually going to be modeling a topic. You often choose your own topic, and it can be a topic that's in uh, a field of interest of yours. And so in some ways, one of the things that you'll be doing is you'll be applying you know, these skills that you're learning at the lower level to the ideas that you're really passionate about. Um, I do know that in environmental design and policy that uh, that uh, Dr. Finn and Dr. Hamada have students walking around campus talking about and thinking about these issues 
uh, early in, in the process. And I know for me, my students are always out. We have a 26-acre woods on campus called the Schiff Woods. My students, no matter the class, 100 to 400 level, they're out in the woods at least two to three times every semester. And so I'm saying that's also true for the environmental studies. While many of the classes are like in marine science and atmospheric building, you mm -hmm. know, kind of those early uh, foundation courses, um, often there are ways to incorporate your interests into those classes on, you know, a research project or on a um, presentation that you may be doing. And this is also a good time to get involved in those clubs and outside things as well. So um, to start, you know, getting to meet people in the area in the in the fields too. Um, uh, and and most majors, I can tell, I can tell, you know, regardless whether it's in something in SOMAS or something in engineering or something in um, College of Arts and Sciences, it, it all really functions the same way. I mean, everything is your foundation courses. Um, and then preparing you for then the next levels. Um, the uh, next question, um, are there research internships with the NOAA or research with them? Um, you know, um, is there, so I guess the students are asking, are there internships or is there research opportunities with um, the NOAA? Yeah, there, there's actually both. I mean, we have a NOAA office, a National Weather Service office uh, about 15, 20 miles away. Uh, from Stony Brook uh, that many of our students take advantage of for internships. Uh, within that office, they have a, a science operations officer who's in charge of the research, and they basically, uh, students can get involved in, in research projects. For example, this uh, winter storms project is in collaboration with them as well in terms of collecting data. I should mention there's scholarship and other summer opportunities that our students have gotten involved with with NOAA, uh, getting involved with uh, um, the whole headquarters there uh, down in DC, the National Centers for Environmental Prediction. We've had students go there uh, outside of NOAA. NASA has a great summer program. We had a student this past summer uh, get to fly in the NASA aircraft and, uh, and, and participate in their summer uh, research program. So a lot of these federal agencies have these uh, type of programs. That's really cool. Um... So uh, this next question is, are, how, how are students picked for research with professors? So, I mean, in one respect, we have Eureka, right? We have the Undergraduate Research and Creative Activities, URECA for students. It's um, an undergraduate program that, you know, uh, uh, undergraduate students will, will be able to do research on campus at Stony Brook, whether it's with faculty, whether it's on their own or with other resources. Um, but if like students, SOMA students, um, are they, is it encouraged that students approach the department or faculty to see if they want to get involved in research? Is that something that, I mean, how do you usually see, how do you usually see the undergrads getting involved in research, I, I guess would be the better question. I, I could speak a little bit about this as a, as a professor where um, it, it happens a number of different ways where uh, uh, I've seen students in the classroom uh, get involved or get interested in a topic and uh, and will approach me after class and say, you know, uh, I'm kind of I'm interested in this area and would like to learn more. Uh, I, I think the way it works, many times students are they get to know their professors, uh, they can look at their websites or get to know them a little bit and then it's always best to just have a conversation with that professor and express your interest in that area. Uh, and then and then that just that just grows. That relationship grows where uh, the, the the usually the professor instructor will uh, you know maybe give a data set to play with and and or meet the rest of the group. and uh, and then before you know it, it turns into a, an opportunity uh, and so forth. So it, you know it's, it kind of just it, it blossoms and grows you know uh, from the bottom up. I think I think in the uh, we see in the semester by the sea also um, when the program kicks off in the fall we have a welcome kind of barbecue event and we have the three research labs uh, that are present at that event and they all stand up and they talk about their research so they kind of reach out to the students um, and the three research labs at Southampton they have fleets of undergraduates working with them these are very active uh, field labs. Um, so sometimes we reach out to the students um, in the marine sciences, especially um, and kind of promote the research, at least at, at Southampton. 
we talked about clubs before also um that's one of the best ways to learn about you know what professors or what research programs are actively taking undergraduates to to, to work with them and then maybe another way um, that students can get plugged into research often is they'll be interacting with graduate students who are often TAs in their courses, teaching assistants in their courses, and they might start chatting with that that graduate student. Often, when the under, when the undergrad graduates are doing research, in some labs they're working most closely with those graduate students rather than with that professor. Um, so, lots of ways, as as Brian said, lots of ways in which students can get involved in research. Just real quickly, too, <clears throat> Stony Brook has an undergraduate research uh, conference in the uh, spring, usually in April. Uh, there's often about, what, Tara, 100 or more students uh, with posters from their research across campus and across all the fields. Uh, within SOMAS, we typically will have 20 to 25 uh, student posters uh, presenting during that time. Thank you, Amanda. And um, uh, the next question is, um, when can experiential learning be uh, accessed? Um, is learning hands-on starting from freshman year or textbook learning until junior? I think we kind of answered this question um, already where um, experiential learning could really be at any point because you could get involved in the clubs and, and, and activities, um, but really the hands-on or maybe, maybe the more, uh, I guess, uh, major specific courses, especially within SOMATS, is much more, I guess, after freshman year. Would, would you guys um, agree with that? I think, I think generally, yes, in, in, the, marine, in the marine science courses. Um, yeah, so we, again, as you said, we talked about clubs. You can always start looking at internships. And again, you don't need to wait until after your freshman year to start making inquiries about getting involved in research labs. But yeah, really getting your, your you know, diving in there typically in the marine sciences after your freshman year yeah do you have a lot of students who especially that summer after freshman year will start to do an internship then mm -hmm. um study abroad you can apply as a freshman i've taken in the winter program students who've had basically one semester um so again there are opportunities right from the beginning um, but often it's a matter of kind of getting your feet wet and deciding which direction you want to go in. So, you know, again, getting involved through clubs is a great way to see what you can do. And you can do that from um, almost the first month at Stony Brook. You know, we have our, our clubs fair. And so students are able to get involved um, in that sense. They can start, you know, networking uh, with SWIM, Society for Women in Marine Science. We have a monthly speaker series with um, women at, you know, in different um, marine fields from all over the country who will talk to students and again, start to create that network right from the very beginning of a student's uh, kind of study. And all students are welcome to come to our speaker series. That's great. Um, and also too, it's great to, you know, for students their freshman year to sort of get acclimated to 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 the new environment, especially if you're um, an incoming freshman as well, just to the university itself um, and uh, and get to know your way around um, as well. But um, does the marine bio? So next question is: Does the marine biology program only cover research and education based in only the marine environments, or does it go into freshwater? um and brackish aqua aquatic environments as well uh, it, it it many of the researchers are probably um maybe a better term for them is a, an aquatic scientist so they they will be doing freshwater and the marine environment so for example um dr gobler down here at southampton he does harmful he works on harmful algal blooms and those can be um, you know, coastal, they can also be in freshwater systems like up in Lake Erie. So he's a great example of that. That's in, in both of those kind of aquatic realms. Um, uh, Dr. Louisa, he does work in, in lakes in East Africa. Um, he's another person that does, you know, coastal marine and freshwater systems. So it really depends on the, the professor that you're talking about. But the short answer is, is yes, there are several that work in, in both freshwater and marine systems. And then the brackish would be kind of the estuarine systems. And there's a lot of research going on in estuaries as well. Um, the next question is, um, 
what, what is the marine science club like <laughs> so we have the atmosphere <laughs> yeah them. so so there it's it's a it's a big club i want to say there's about 40 40 kind of active members that they know that show up at the meetings um it's it's a lot like you know Brian talked about with the meteorology club. Um, these are these are very active students in terms of um, planning trips together. Um, they'll go to the aquarium together. They'll do beach cleanups. I know swims does does uh, um, some coastal cleanups as well. Um, they have invited speakers. Uh, they're they're very active, and I'm always encouraging students to get plugged into the marine science club as soon as they can. Again, because of all these benefits that we've talked about in the various clubs. Um, so yeah, they're they're a really fun group, as I think all these student clubs are. Yeah. Okay. With the um, the next question is, um, I guess with the students asking, um, is there um, in terms of certifications with some of the scuba programs that 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 we have here? Um, is it recommended getting uh, any kind of certification ahead of it or extra certification to get into the scuba uh, programs? So a couple of the courses like scientific diving, they've got a very limited enrollment. So we're talking 10 or 12 students each fall. Um, so if the more experienced you are as a diver, the more likely you are to get into those those kind of upper level or that upper level course, I should say. Um, so again, it's kind of up to you. You know, if, if you're not certified yet, you can either get it on your own or you can get certified while here as a student. Um, again, if you are getting certified as a student and taking that class, that's one class that's in your schedule. Um, if you get certified earlier, then that frees up that block in your schedule to take a different class. So again, there's a lot of there's kind of pros and cons to either getting certified first or getting certified here. It depends on kind of what, what you want to do. I think I answered. Did I answer the question? I think. I yeah, did. yeah, definitely. Um, so the next one is, um, I know, Brian, you mentioned some students go into conferences, like you mentioned, the one going to the ones going to Denver, I believe you said. Um, uh, do students ever travel with faculty to conferences, like if they're working, I guess, with someone in a lab or maybe maybe working in research, that type of thing? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, the students usually travel together sort of as a as a community and so forth, but I um, but the faculty are usually there as well. Um, a couple examples, I mentioned the Denver one, I'm going to be there uh, at that meeting. We have the Northeast Storms Conference in March. Uh, that's another one that the, the Atmospheric uh, uh, Club goes up to, for example, and, and I'll be there as well as as other as well as other faculty such as Michael French here. And so um, so in fact, maybe on our web page, there might be <clears throat> a mugshot or two of me uh, with the students posing at some of these conferences. But yeah, so it, it's it's always an enjoyable experience. That's great. Um... Is it possible to get dry suit certified in the scuba program you offer? Uh, I do not believe so. Um, the uh, dive shop that does the certifications, they might offer that separately, but it wouldn't be part of our academic programming. Um, so I, I don't believe so, no. Okay. And this uh, question, um, if I were to focus more upon conserving larger marine animals, such as whales and dolphins, which program is catered towards that area a bit more? Is the semester by the sea beneficial to that research? I, I would I would focus on faculty, perhaps, that are courses that are related to those topics okay. and faculty that are actually actively doing that, that research. Um, so, for example, Dr. Warren, um, he's starting to look at um, uh, dolphins around artificial reefs. I think Dr. Thorne as well is, is doing that um, off of Long Island. Um, Dr. Warren also works with whales sometimes. He's done some uh, tagging of whales. He focuses on uh, the whale's prey field, so schools of fishes, um, krill, and so on. And he actually uses acoustics to kind of sense those, those fields. But He's kind of indirectly working with those larger mammals, those those whales. Um, so I might recommend, um, you know, don't focus on the semester by the sea for that necessarily, but rather focus on the faculty who are doing that research and also organizations around Stony Brook um, that are focusing on those on those organi or, organ organisms as well. So 
For example, there's the Atlantic Marine Conservation Society down here near Southampton. There's the New York Marine Rescue Center. Um, and there's Cresley, which I always forget what that stands for. Uh, but we have a faculty member who does a lot of kind of seal monitoring. I know that wasn't the whales, but a lot of larger marine mammals. There are many folks who are working with those mammals. Tara, do you want to add anything to that? You're active. Um, in York Cresley's the Coastal Research and Education of Long Island. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> They're the Center for Coastal Research and Education in Long Island. Um, but you can do um, uh, whale uh, uh, studies with some of your internship programs. We've also had students who have worked with uh, dolphin rehabilitation down in Florida. Um, so again, this is where internship opportunities are often very, very beneficial for students. The next question is, are there any research programs working jointly with the AMNH? AMNH, and that is... The what National is... History Museum? That was the closest I can get. Was it AMNH? -A -A yeah, AMNH. Okay. There's so many. I only know the American Museum of Natural History. History, yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. Um, <laughs> oh, yes, they clarified. Okay, yep. I want to say that we've had either interns there or we've had students who have graduated and have worked there, but I, I can't remember. The uh, American Museum of Natural History. Um, we actually have had students who have done both internships there, and we do actually have um, a former alum. Or not former, but alum that are working with the natural history museums. Yeah. Um, we also have them at some of um, um, other places throughout the U.S. kind of working in that same field for museum studies and kind of curatorial on that end. Great. Um, all right. The next question is, although the major is marine vertebrate biology, I'm curious as to how often we might have opportunities to learn about non-vertebrates like cephalopods, uh, cephal 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 uh, you know, echinoderms, and so on. Are there pre-existing research opportunities outside of classes regarding these types of organisms and their conservation? So again, it'll depend on the research. Look at some of the researchers within SOMAS. We do have some folks that are focusing on that are that are researching zooplankton. So so tinafores, the, the comb jellies, for example. Um, we actually have a cephalopod. We have an octopus in our lab here at Southampton, but um, no one's really doing research on her at this this point. But she's fun to look at and interact with. Um, so again, I think it's important to look at the um, look at the the various faculty members and their their research topics. And the short answer is yes. There are some who are focusing on certainly non um, non uh, vertebrate organisms. If you take some of the courses, so for example, Long Island Marine Habitats, a course that we offer both at the main camp or at the main campus and down here at Southampton, you will learn about a lot of non-vertebrate organisms, um, local marine organisms as well. That's great. Um, so how many certifications can you get through the SCUBA program? I think, I think just just oh. I think two. I think the you know the intro and then the scientific diving certification. I think it's just two at, at this point. Um, Dr. Peterson here at Southampton, he's our dive safety officer, and he's been clearly instrumental in creating this this the scuba program. Um, but again, the uh, Hampton Dive Shop that does the certifications, there are opportunities probably outside of academics to get additional, to accrue additional certifications. Oh, uh, along those lines, I was actually just talking to someone today. The dive shop also employs our students on occasion, or um, we have interns at the dive shop. So there's lots of ways to kind of expand your scuba experience beyond what I've just outlined here in this presentation. And last question, has research on whale falls and the ecosystems that surround them been done? Some of it. I'm trying to think if it's been done by SOMAS faculty. Um, we have several folks that are studying, they're, they're kind of studying marine microbes, which we'll find around the, the whale falls. Um, the marine mammologists I'm thinking of within SOMAS, like Dr. Warren and, and Dr. Thorne, are probably not doing that so much. Um, but, but again, uh, um, I'm not sure about that. 
Good question. Yeah, the the um, uh, one of the one of the questions too was there a, accommodation? We have uh, accommodations for students or learning accommodations for students, and we do have that. Um, we have the student accessibility support services for all students. So now, so no matter what major. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention too is uh, we do have an academic tutoring center as well. Uh, um, so um, all those kind of things where if you're having trouble in courses, uh, we have um, staff uh, staffed offices that will help students in terms of courses, and um, uh, you know they they'll work with students by appointment to meet with them, and that's there's no additional cost for that. Um, it's right. all. Can, yes. can I jump in? So, so sure. SOMAS also has um, excellent advising, academic advising. Um, in fact, I think everybody but me here is is a, is a major advisor. Um, <laughs> and, and Nancy is SOMAS's general undergraduate advisor. So we have several level, levels of advisement within SOMAS as well. Um, well, that was it. We had that was the most questions I think I've ever done in one of these. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, and uh, so uh, I just want to say uh, thank you to everyone here uh, from SOMAS. Um, you know, thank you for taking your time out um, to talk with uh, our prospective students. Um, I really appreciate it. And um, I want to thank all the students that have attended too. Thanks for taking the time out to turn a little, learn a little bit more about Stony Brook and, and uh, um, the, the programs and, and opportunities in SOMAS. Um, if you have any questions, Amanda did give provide you the uh, links and everything to our our office. If you need any, uh, if you have any questions, we have tours and everything going out, and we have an info session uh, that's virtual that goes into more depth of terms of uh, you know what we're looking for in terms of applicants and the application process and so on and so forth. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us, and I uh, wish you the best. Uh, have a great holiday and uh, have a great night. Take care. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you.